In this video, I will be doing an overview of uh, the four different types of plant hormones that you need to know um, in the in the course. Um, so this is uh, aiming to be an overview. So um, obviously there are some bits of processes that you do need to know for the plant hormones topic, but hopefully this overview will give you a, a better idea in terms of how the different hormones actually interact. So uh, the aim is to look at the four different uh, plant hormones and the general roles that they have in uh, promoting or even inhibiting plant growth. And then looking at the concept of hormonal balance and also how scientists actually came to know how these hormones actually work. So first of all, let's look at the four different hormones. And the first one we'll look at is um, one of the most famous one, which is oxids. So a type of auxins is IAA, and you don't need to worry too much about the full name of it, but just be aware that that is the case. So first of all, let's look at a few of its functions. So one of the key ones is that auxins uh, control cell elongation. So uh, cell elongation is in some sense cell growth. So for example, let's say we have a plant cell that looks a bit like this to start with, but with more, uh, more auxins in place, it would grow into maybe let's say about this big. So that's cell elongation, making the cell longer and bigger. And obviously that's important in terms of um, initial plant cell growth in order to facilitate the growth of the whole plant. Another key thing that auxins do is that they maintain apical dominance. So in order to understand uh, apical dominance, uh, one key thing to know is that auxins are produced by meristems. And meristems are basically plant stem cells and you can find them in the tip of plant shoots. And one of the uh, things that auxins can do is that they would promote the apical shoot growth. The apical shoot is referring to the main uh, stem that is growing vertically upwards. And then the other thing is we have the lateral shoots, which are the shoots that grow sideways. So in this case, in terms of apical dominance, it's, it's, what it's meaning is that auxins favour the growth of the apical uh, shoot that grows upwards but it actually kind of inhibits the growth of the lateral shoots that go sideways. So since the auxins are produced by the meristems, which are found at the tip of the, uh, of the apical shoot, uh, that means that the shoot growing vertically would grow a lot higher, but then the lateral shoots that grow near the top, when there's a lot of auxins made here, uh, they would not actually, um, the, the, the lateral shoots would not grow very um, long near the top whereas as you go further down the shoot because there's less auxins further down the apical shoot therefore the lateral shoots are more likely to grow longer and further down grows longer like that and one way that scientists actually discover this is that they actually chop off the tip of they chop the tip of a um, apical shoot to see the difference so if you chop it off so it becomes like you know just like that a little stud then what they found was that the um was that the lateral shoots could grow a lot more um near the top and so they kind of exhibit a shape so the plant would exhibit a shape that looks like this so kind of like an upside down christmas tree so um this is one of the things that oxygen can do that maintain apical dominance and we will talk about why this is good in another video but it's about again competition or making sure that they can get enough light for the different shoots and leaves. A third thing that auxins can do, which is quite often mentioned, is um, that auxins are involved in tropisms. So tropisms refer to um, how the plants can respond to the, any environmental changes. And two specific um, tropisms that you need to be aware of would be phototropisms and geotropism, or sometimes you might have heard people saying gravitropism. Looking at the names, you can kind of see what stimulus we're referring to. So phototropism is about how plants respond to the presence of light. And geotropism refers to the plant responding, or plant growth responding to um, the orientation of the location of the plant. So a the most straightforward way to represent this is, let's say um, this is the ground, and we got a plant that is growing in here. So let's say there's the shoot going down. This is a very simplistic diagram. Um, so let's say, for example, that the sun or the light source is on one particular side. So it's a unilateral side. So rather than the plant growing upwards or growing straight up, 
the stem or the shoot would bend towards the light as you probably would have noticed in a lot of plants or a very obvious one would be sunflowers they would the flowers would bend towards the light so this is a an example of positive phototropism about how the plants would turn or the stem or the leaves would turn towards the light and there's obviously negative phototropism which is what the roots would exhibit they would turn away from light again we'll talk about this in another video a positive geotropism example would be from the roots where they would grow according to the direction of gravity basically so if the plant is actually turned sideways instead then the roots would still turn towards the gravity or towards the ground because that's most likely where water and mineral ions are going to be whereas usually the flowers or the stem would exhibit negative geotropism because um, the ground is less likely to, gonna, to have light so they would turn the opposite way but anyways we'll talk more about this in another video so um, oxygens have uh, loads of different things but these are three of the things that they would promote or maintain and i would like to talk about two things that oxygens actually inhibit so one thing that they would inhibit is fruit ripening so the idea is that if there's a high concentration of oxygens then fruit will not turn ripe another thing that they in also inhibit is the uh, is abscission so abscission uh, tends to be a bit more focused in terms of how uh, leaves would fall off so for example near autumn time the leaves would um, would undergo abscission where they fall off the uh, stem itself again we'll talk about the uh, why that is actually beneficial to the plant so oxygens inhibit these two things but there's another hormone uh, by the plant that actually promotes these two things because otherwise obviously it's part of their life cycle and that's important so the other plant hormone is called ethene so ethene does the exact opposite is that they promote abscission and they promote fruit ripening so that's why sometimes people say that if you put certain fruits inside a bag and the fruit itself or some of the stems of the fruit would release ethene and it speeds up fruit ripening because it's trapping the ethene inside that bag so you can see that ethene and oxygen actually work in um, kind of an opposite way they oppose each other and this is what we refer uh, refer to as antagonistic relationships so they actually um, work against each other they oppose each other we'll come back to this concept in a bit so another one is gibberellins so gibberellins actually um, almost like work together with auxins in a lot of the times in terms of plant growth because they also uh, promote lots of different things so one key thing is that they promote stem elongation not to confuse this with cell elongation which we looked at that is done by auxins so cell elongation is about the growth of one cell where stem elongation is looking at the growth of the stem so this probably comes later on in terms of the plant growth so to look at this a bit more detail is that stem elongation when we look at that is about increasing the length of the internodes for example let's say we have a uh, plantlet here so a tiny little plant so this is a plantlet if there is a higher concentration of gibberellins then the plant will look like this instead so the internodes refer to the distance between uh, the branches or the lateral shoots growth as you can see here so if there is more gibberellins then the internodes would uh, increase this is what we mean by stem elongation so it's not just one single cell but maybe loads and loads of cell in general and obviously this is beneficial in terms of plant growth because they can grow upwards to get more light another thing that gibberellins can do is that they promote germination so again it's something about plant uh, promoting plant growth um, maybe early on before even stem elongation happens so it's literally when it's in its seed or in bud form it's about promoting that growth but maybe even before that um, gibberellins actually promote the pollen tube growth in fertilization so it actually aids fertilization and aids the growth there so you can see that gibberellins is very much involved in the growth of a plant so in some sense we can say that it actually works um, together with auxins to promote the general growth and development of a plant and this is a concept we refer to as synergism but again more on that later on the fourth hormone and the last hormone we'll look at is uh, abscisic acid or better known as ABA 
I mean, the name kind of gives it away. It is involved in obsession, but we're not going to focus on that one for now. We're going to look at in terms of how it influences um, other things in terms of the plant growth. So there are two main things that we'll look at here. One thing is that they maintain dormancy of seeds and buds. So it's actually um, stopping the seeds and buds to germinate in the first place. So you can see it works directly against sugar islands. Another thing that ABA can do is that they would simulate protective measures or protective responses uh, when the plant is under some sort of uh, stress. And we'll actually look at plant stress later on. Um, so two examples is that if it's too cold, let's say in the winter time, um, they can uh, stimulate the release of antifreeze chemicals um, to stop the plant from overfreezing, or they can uh, stimulate the stomata uh, to close. So again, for example, if the plant is losing too much water, so it's going into dehydration, then they would prompt the stomata to close to prevent further loss of water through transpiration. So as I said, you can see that some of the actions of ABA count, uh, counteracts the actions of gibberellin. So again, they share um, an antagonistic relationship as well. So they work against each other. So this kind of, you can see the interactions, um, some of the interactions between different hormones. So I'm not saying that this is absolutely the case, but the two examples of relationship we've seen so far is synergism and uh, antagonism. So synergism is when we talk about how two hormones are working together and antagonism is about how the hormones are opposing each other or working against each other. So one of the key concepts to take away from this whole chapter actually is that we need to try to be careful when we are answering questions. Try to avoid saying things like because auxins are present or gibberellas are present or etc. We need to say in terms of their concentration. So when there's a higher concentration of ethene, um, therefore, fruit ripening is, is occurring. Because again, you can see here, fruit ripening is stimulated by ethene, but opposed and inhibited by oxygen. So if you simply say that ethene is present, is not enough. It's about the concentration of the different hormones. So this is the concept about the hormonal balance. I mean, this is technically the same in terms of animal hormones when we look at that in a different chapter, but it's even more so the case in plant hormones. So the last thing before we finish this video is to look at the evidence. So um, throughout this chapter, actually, in the textbook, you can see that they would talk about how, um, how scientists actually figure this out because it's not easy to study plant hormones. And to be honest, scientists still don't know everything about plant hormones. They exist in such small concentrations, unlike the hormones we can, we can check in animals, because in animals you can uh, probably quite easily do a blood test, for example, because we've got lots of blood running around. But plant hormones is different. It's very, plants are very delicate most of the time, and they, they, these plant hormones exist in such small concentrations that it's hard to just extract um, fluids from the plant um, without damaging them in the first place. So how did scientists actually uh, find out how these hormones work? So there are a few things that they do and whenever you get asked, it's probably it's going to be one of these uh, three methods really. So the first thing that scientists did or one thing that they can do is through um, manipulating the genes. So it's kind of like the chapter um, which you will learn in terms of a gene expression uh, how scientists find out, generally speaking, how genes work is by mutating them and then seeing the effect. So in the case of plants, you can, uh, plants are generally easier to do in, um, genetic engineering on. Um, and uh, you can mutate the genes that make a specific hormone. So let's say mutate the gene that makes uh, ABA and then see what happens to the plant, right? Just see the effects of it. So kind of like how scientists mutate the genes of fruit flies and then to kind of find out homeobox genes, right? find out how um, how specific genes control where our body parts go, essentially. So they use the same technique here, mutating a gene that makes a hormone and then observe the results. And then therefore, if you mutate the gene for um, ethene and then find out that abscission isn't happening, then you know, okay, ethene is involved in promoting abscission. 
The second method is quite similar as well. So you are you can disrupt the production pathway through uh, other proteins or enzymes uh, or chemicals that you add to it. So you stop the production of a particular hormone and then observe the results. So same method, um, except that you probably do it as the plant is growing, etc. So the third method is again the same concept, but this is even easier. You just cut the shoot tip, and then by doing so, you're re you're basically removing the Mary stems from the plant. So you're re removing oxygen entirely, and then it's the same. So for all of these methods, you are looking at a few different things. But in cutting to the shoot tip, it's something that you can even do at school by yourself easily. And so after cutting shoot tip, you do th three things. First of all, is that you see if there are any changes to the actual plant, right? and that would probably tell you a little bit more in terms of how the oxygen actually influence them. The second thing you do is then you apply the hormones externally. So this is easily, this can be easily done by oxygens, um, uh, with oxygen chemicals really. Uh, so the things that people do is maybe they put like a gel that is made up with uh, that has oxygens mixed within it, and then just they just simply place it. Or clip it on the uh, on the shoot tip and see what happens. Um, and essentially, the third thing that you do is to see are there any further changes. If you have previously removed the shoot tip, you remove the auxins, you observe a change, you put the auxins back in. Would they reverse that change and go back to normal? And then that would it's almost like confirming that auxins is actually are actually responsible for that particular action of the plant. And this. Third method is perhaps uh, best for auxins because we know very clearly that they are produced by the meristems, whereas the other three um, hormones are produced in other places that are probably hard to remove without causing a massive issue or, or just simply hard to um, because they exist in every or they are made in every single cell. So um, the third method is most likely to be used in auxins and honestly probably one of the more popular exam questions. Um, or scenario questions that you will get in exams. So there you have it. This is an overview of the four plant hormones that you will learn in this whole chapter and a brief overview in terms of their roles or their effects and looking at the concept of hormonal balance and the evidence in which that we as scientists have, have, um, have got for understanding how plant hormones work. So in some of the later, later videos within this uh, plant hormones playlist, we will actually look into how uh, cell elongation actually works, how abscission actually occurs, and also a little bit more about the process of plant growth and development, um, how farmers can actually use their knowledge on plant hormones to influence um, the growth of their crops to maximize, pro maximize profit. So we'll look at these different things in the subsequent videos in this playlist.